I read uh, Emmy's essay in Grace Upon Grace about being locked behind, uh, behind a door. And I was immediately, when she was three years old, if you haven't read it, read it. And I was immediately transported to being a five-year-old myself and being locked in a closet by my older sister, uh, who then went off to play with a friend. And I was, it struck me how you know, somebody shares a story and suddenly you're transported, right? And I can tell, I can see the door, I can see, I can tell you where I was. I, you know, I, we were in a college dorm in Holland, Michigan, Hope College, because my dad was taking summer courses, right? Yeah, it's, you know, and so vivid. I would say I was not scarred by it, but I still remember it, right? And things happen like that, where you, somebody starts to share a story. I could just say, hey, remember your first kiss? Right, and now we're all gone, right? For a second, and it's either, you know, you're like, ah, or, or you're smiling, or a combination of both. But there are also experiences that we have uh, where it, it touches everybody. Uh, for, for some folks, you know, um, I remember hearing this growing up, I was like, do you remember where you were when Kennedy was shot? Or when you heard that Martin Luther King Jr. was killed? For the younger people, I, I just want to say, I was not born. Uh, when those, I, uh, same year, 1968 was a, was a significant year, but uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was killed in April and I was born in July, but for both of those. But I can tell you where I was when the Challenger exploded. And I'm told that that's also significant for, for many people. That's part of our communal experience. When 9-11 happened, we all had a story. Uh, and when the COVID lockdown became real, I was in Cuba when President Trump closed travel from China. And I'm sure you know, people around the world who were traveling, we were all afraid of getting stuck. So all calling the airlines, trying to change our, our, our flights and, and get flights back earlier. And this is, this is my um, shameful story of, of the COVID lockdown. Uh, the Senate administrator was picking up her phone to call the, the airline, and I said to her, uh, thank you for your leadership, and then I went to bed. And in retrospect, I realized that I should have sat up with her and held her up while she held that phone. Because when she tells the story of how she was on the, holding that phone for hours with a shaky uh, cell service and terrified that it was going the call was going to drop and it actually did drop right before the guy gave her the confirmation and then she checked online and so she's telling this whole thing and I instantly realized oh Robin you were a jerk you should have set up with her now other people did but that's you know I when I realized what um, what I did I, I reached out to her and I said, you know, I'm not proud of that. I'm so sorry. And if I had to do it again, I would have stayed up with you. And she was, of course, very, very gracious. Uh, if you haven't read the story uh, in, that was also, I think, um, contributed by Janet Spain in the newsletter about the mouse looking to the other farm animals uh, for help. And they all said, not my job, not my problem. That, I thought of that when I read, uh, when I read that parable in, in the newsletter. Before I left for Cuba, there were no bacterial wipes uh, to take on my trip. So I improvised. I added some bleach and water and like this little, you know, it wasn't a Tupperware, but something like that. And you know, to, to be able to clean the seats and you know, when we were all cleaning everything. Uh, but when I, when I got back, uh, there was no toilet paper. Thankfully, I had bought a big thing beforehand, so I wasn't stressed about that. But I was uh, put in quarantine a couple, a few days before everyone else. And so I'm sending my kids to the grocery store saying, you know, pick up some chicken, pick up some rice, pick up some beans, pick up. Um, and they came home saying, there's no meat. There's no meat. And that feeling, and, well, and I will confess to you that I cursed everyone who filled up their extra large freezers uh, with all the food that they could fit. And I, know, and, I, and I say this knowing that if some folks in the room did that, um, I talked with uh, a relative of mine who, uh, who did that you know, for she and her husband. And, 
And she said, you know, it's, it's human nature, and it is. Um, and she goes, and we're going to eat it. <laughs> and, and in my, and I didn't say it, but in my mind, yeah, but not all of us have an extra large freezer, and some of us didn't get any. And that has been a lasting, uh, that, that whole hoarding piece that, that we went through together communally is going to stuck with me in, in, in my psyche. And I think I'm, I'm not alone in that. Um, and, you know, and as I, I, you know, as I would do differently now in supporting Lori on the phone, I, I hope that we would all do differently next time. We've learned a lot about ourselves during this pandemic and we're still learning. And due to the hoarding, I resolved uh, for the rest of my life um, that if I will never take the last of anything on the shelf. Uh, if I go in for two and there's only two, I will only take one. Uh, just because of that experience of there being there being nothing on the shelves. In the book Braiding Sweetgrass, uh, written by Robin Wall Kimmerer, which you all, I, this is a whole plug for the newsletter throughout this time. I'm reading the newsletter this week, and uh, so many things are res resonating. It's one of my favorite books, uh, and Jean Sampson recommended it in the newsletter. And Robin uh, Wall Kimmerer is a uh, Native American indigenous. And she'll talk about, or she teaches, that in her tradition, when they go foraging for food, you're out and you'll see something, you'll see a patch of something. Before you pick anything, you make sure that there's another patch so that you wouldn't, so that you, you know that it can, you know, reseed and you wouldn't be taking the last of anything. And in the patch that you do decide to take from, you would never take all of it. And I thought, that's just brilliant. We come from our culture that's very individual, individualistic, with a strong, you know, uh, uh, you know, sense of, you know, me, myself, and I, look out for number one, all of those things, where, versus a taught conscientiousness about the welfare of the whole. Jesus would have us care about the welfare of the whole. It's throughout scripture. For God so loved the world, and we are called to love God, love neighbor as we love ourselves. It might go against instinct, but that is who and how God calls us to be. Our scripture lessons challenges us on our perceptions of scarcity, of not having enough. Now, I, I'm a, a believer in miracles. Uh, I believe that Jesus walked on water. Uh, but years ago, I heard an interpretation of this miracle story in Scripture that we read from John, but it's the only miracle story that is in all four Gospels. And, uh, but the, the interpretation of this miracle story is that they, they believe that the, the miracle was everybody's willingness to share, that they actually had food with them. Right? And so this little boy offers up everything that he has, and then everybody else was just like, oh, well, you know, I'll take what I need, but I'll, I'll put what I have in the basket. And then that's why there's so much, uh, so much left over. And you could say, no, 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 it was a miracle. And hallelujah, amen, I'm cool with that. But either way, we're going to get to the same point, which is what, what, whatever you have, give it away. God can make miracles with even the littlest of offerings. We live in a culture that worries about me, myself, and I, and the gospel is counterintuitive. We worship a gracious God uh, whose response to unfaithfulness is forgiveness and whose love is boundless. It's no, there is no beginning, there is no end, there is no height nor depth to it. When we see limits, God is limitless. When we see scarcity, God has provided more than enough. Let's walk through the telling of the story. Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of Tiberias. That's added, the Romans called it the Sea of Tiberias. The gospel writer includes that so that we are reminded that all of this happens within the context of uh, Roman occupation. That there's a political context to, to all of this. That Jesus, the following of Jesus, he is perceived as a threat um, and, that we, and that we notice that, that the spiritual... Jesus' spiritual teachings have a political effect. 
that the gospel worldview has an effect on our politics. As readers, we are reminded that um, this is happening near Passover, which would make everybody think of Moses. And, and those folks know in their Bible would say, oh, remember when Moses called on God to provide meat because the people were complaining and God provided more than enough, Numbers 11. And they would also think of the prophet Elisha that we just read from, from, uh, from 2 Kings, who had a similar miracle transpired. There were, there were you know, asset services to serve the people food. How can I? There's, nothing, there's hardly any. And, and Elisha says, just do it. And then there was more than enough at the end. When Jesus, oh, I, let me back up for a second. So when their mind at verse 14, where we, where we read that they say, oh, this is the prophet who is to come, just like Elisha, Elisha did this. Look, Jesus is doing this. When Jesus asked everyone to sit down, the setting is noted. Everything in scripture is there for a reason. And it is noted there was a great deal of grass in the place. What does that make you think of? We read it last week in scripture. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Right? God, the caretaker, is in charge. And then there are 12 baskets left over. Why 12? 12 disciples. With the idea that maybe literally feeding people will be part of their discipleship, will be part of their ministry moving forward. And as we see, and we see that it is in the beginning of Acts, what did they do? They gathered, they broke bread together, they gave to any as had need. And by the way, also to be read in your in your newsletter, and this is all an extended again advertisement for the and I, I wrote Pat a note this week. It's the best church newsletter I have ever I have ever read. Um, it's really, really good. Uh, but I'm so impressed by your mesh team every Saturday. Every Saturday, showing up and giving to people as they have need. In this passage, we see the power of God and the heart of God on display. We have Jesus messing with our sense of what is possible. We see ourselves in, in you know, that perpetual focus on what we don't have. We have sympathy for Philip and his doubt. And you're quick to look at the limitations and not the possibilities. And then there's Jesus saying, whatever you have, give it away. God can make a miracle. The gospel calls us to, to think differently, to act differently. And whether you think that the miracle was a mystery of God or whether you, uh, it was a culmination of people getting beyond their fear of not having enough, at the end, we are all handed baskets and being asked to give it away, to distribute to all who have need. I want to end with, with a poem. And, and last night, I'm, I was reading this, and I'm like, oh, oh, somebody in the newsletter, it's a poem by Mary Oliver. I'm like, somebody else in the newsletter uh, recommended uh, Mary Oliver. Who is that? Who is that? <laughs> it was me. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 Margo also quoted Mary Oliver in, in her in her contribution to the newsletter, but I was laughing, I'm like, oh that's hysterical. But this this poem focuses on this passage on this miracle. It's called Logos, which is Greek for word. And she says, Why worry about the loaves and fishes? If you say the right words, the wine expands. If you say them with love, and the felt ferocity of that love and the felt necessity of that love, the fish explode into many. Imagine him speaking. And don't worry about what is reality or what is plain or what is mysterious. If you were there, it was all those things. If you can imagine it, it is all those things. Eat, drink, be happy, accept the miracle, accept to each spoken word spoken with love. I pray that the ferocity of God's love might explode in your hearts and manifest in, in faith, in compassion, and in generosity. May our arms extend to receive the baskets 
and spend our lives giving ourselves away in love for the world. Whatever God has given you, use it. God can make a miracle through you and me. In Jesus' name, amen.